Next question is from Danny Matrenga. You talk about the importance of one's relationship with food and exercise. How does one maintain a healthy relationship with money? Oh, good question, Danny. Oh, hey, oh, Danny. Wow. Danny, finally Look asking some guy. good questions, yeah, guys. Yeah. the first time he asked a really good question. <laughs> I think <laughs> we should give him a little star, yeah, a ribbon nah, or something. Nah, he's our, he's a good yeah. Danny, for those of you who don't know, he's our, he's our head trainer. Yeah, super, he's, he's super, our guy. super smart kid. He's all over our, our, uh, our YouTube channel. Do you know why this is a phenomenal question? I, I learned this recently, relatively recently, that you, you look at nutrition and exercise and, and how people can develop a bad relationship with them or a good relationship with them. And once you develop a good relationship with exercise and nutrition, you have this balance, this natural balance. You take care of yourself, you eat right, you exercise, it feels good. It's not this crazy struggle back and forth. Same thing with money. Same thing with money. People who tend to have money issues, it tends to be because they have a bad relationship with money. Such right. a such a good point. And it's, it's, it's don't you so feel funny. like there's the the same type of oh, extremes too? The right? impulsivity, right? It applies to money just like it does food and everything else. Dude, I you know it's funny. I, I had a, a friend whose family had constant issues with money, and you know they would always either be in debt or couldn't pay bills, and you'd see the gifts that they'd buy each other for Christmas, and they were ridiculous, expensive presents and stuff. And I know they're being very, you know, they're trying to be, you know, good and nice and show their love. But I remember thinking like, that's a, that's a bad relationship with money. You're always struggling with money. And then when it's time to buy a gift, you spend $500. Right. You know, that, that shows that there's a little bit of a, a of an issue with money that you don't necessarily respect it or value it, you know, in a healthy way. So this is something that I think people need to work on um, in those studies. They have studies on, on lottery uh, winners. I talk about that all the time. Like people will win the lottery and two years later they're broke. Or you have celebrities who are totally broke. Michael Jackson, you know when he died? He was something like $500 million in debt. Oh, uh, really? Even after taking the Beatles uh, catalog? Yes. $500 wow. million dollars in debt because he had just this terrible spending habits. Oh, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, so um, this- Too many Ferris wheels. Yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. Well, what do, you, what do you think about your, your, per, your personal relationship with money and, and how have you managed that? You know, I grew up, um, so both of my parents are immigrants. Um, my mom came here when she was four. Uh, my dad came here after he married my mom. Both of them, very poor upbringing. So when my grandfather, my mom's dad came here, he had very little skills, um, you know, that were applicable to you know the new place that he moved. He became a custodian, worked his ass off. It's funny, my family's the exact people that you know programs are designed for that are supposed to help them, and no one in my family's ever enrolled in any of these programs because they're always about like, I'm going to work as hard as I possibly can and find every opportunity I possibly can. I'm not talking down on people that need help. It's just an it just kind of sh highlighting kind of the attitude that they have. So my grandfather worked seven days a week. My mom grew up, you know, lower middle class, but they they never bought things they didn't have money for. They saved every penny. My dad grew up very poor. He started working full time at the age of nine. So nine years old, he had to go to work. Didn't go to school anymore. Um, and when my parents got married, my mom would tell me, you know, I remember as a, as a real young kid, my mom would take napkins. And she'd open them up and she'd break them up into four squares. Mm -hmm. She'd tear them up. And she used cloth diapers with me and my sister um, because they couldn't afford diapers. When we would go out to dinner, like a bit like, oh my God, hey, hey everybody, we're going to go out to dinner. It was a big deal. It was McDonald's. We'd go to McDonald's. Remember this as a kid, you know, that, that was a big deal. Um, we were never in debt. My parents were able to raise four kids, have a house that they were able to pay and my dad had uh, no further education than I think third grade, um, and he worked very, very hard and very, and they saved a lot. And so my my relationship with money was work hard and save. Now that's good, but it's not great because right. I never learned the other side of it, which was invest. Yeah, it was all about saving, save, 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 and didn't know anything about investing. So then when I was, you know, nineteen years old, managing gyms, um, I was one of the top performers. At a big fitness company. This is back in 1998. I was making uh, 100. I made 120 grand. I think that first year, which for a 19 year old is a shit ton of money, especially back in 1998. I never bought a. I didn't buy a house. I didn't buy. I didn't invest in the stock market. All I did was put it in the bank and live at home. With my parents, mm. which was better than I think a lot of kids would have done. But I wish I had that that other person in my life that could be like, Hey, what are you doing with your money? Like, you got you got all this money saved up. Let's take 
forty thousand and buy this property and and, and well, teach I, it to invest. I, you know? I also think that there's. I think it's a spectrum, just like there. And I love that you started with the analogy of of exercise and food and how that. And I think there is what we what most people would think is a really healthy relationship could be borderline unhealthy too on the other extreme. Right there, so there. I think that there's extremes on both ends of the spectrum. That somebody who has a terrible relationship with it, they buy thousand dollar gifts for Christmas when they barely make five hundred dollars a month, is totally irresponsible, and they never have money, and they're broke, and whatever. And then there's the other person who makes all this money and they save and invest and they put it all in these things like this and they never spend it or do anything with it. Yeah, I you, think, can, you can become a miser. I think that's you can make all this money and live in like yeah. a little shack and you know Right. Yeah. I think I think that's unhealthy too. The, the funny part about it, there's so many social constructs that are that are surround money. It's really it's really an interesting topic and a and a topic that I like to talk about and, and learn about and think about because really all it is is fucking paper. It's really just a way for us to exchange things, right? 100%. Uh, I go to work every day. I work really hard. I get paid for that, right? That's why. I, and then what I do with that is, well, you know, I, I can exchange that money for something else. Now, you can save it and exchange it for security because some people value that highly. Or you can exchange it for things because some people value that highly. But really, I think it's understanding that balance. And I think to your point, Sal, that you know, when you really get at control of it, I think you have a really nice ebb and flow. Um, you know, I, I personally save and invest, but I also, I also spend like I, I, I don't, I have friends that, um, save everything, man. I, my, I have a buddy of mine who may, may have as much maybe as uh, saved up as me and make significantly less than what I do. And, and is always thinking about investment in the future, um, but I also, I see the way that he lives his life and I think, man, that's so crazy. You have all this money in the bank and invested and, you know, you're, and you're, you're worried about, you know, having a second streaming service cause it's three ninety nine a month. Like that's to me crazy. If there's a show on there that you really love and enjoy and, and it gives you fulfillment to watch it, but you're going to choose not to do it because three ninety nine times 12 months adds up to a whole 50 or $60 that you could have used. Like, yeah. So I really think that there's also a balance too, because then you could spend your whole life preparing for the future, which may never come for you. What or are you may, really working for? Or may get taken away from you. Mm -hmm. So I think I think sometimes we we look at, at money and we, we give it this thing so much more than what it really is. Well, it really is just an exchange for your labor. If, that you, you, if you compare it to food, because it's easier for us to communicate, I think, when it comes to nutrition, because that's what we, I have a very, I have a much better grasp of what a bad relationship and good relationship to food is, or at least I can communicate it better than when I try to communicate with money. So when, like with food, there's eating for enjoyment, there's eating for health and, and sustenance and performance. When does it become pathological? Mm. It becomes pathological when I'm eating to fulfill something that can never be fulfilled with food. Mm -hmm. Right. If I'm trying to eat because I'm depressed or I'm numbing myself or I'm distracting myself, now it's become pathological. Okay. So if I'm buying things because I'm trying to distract myself, right. because I'm fulfilling something that cannot be fulfilled with money, like I'm lonely. So I'm going to spend tons of money on- I'm going to go to the mall and just shop. Yeah. Or buy friends, hang right, out with my right, friends and pay right. for everything because I'm lonely. Right. Or, or I'm insecure. And so I'm buying these things so I look more powerful. I got to have a nice car so everybody thinks I look cool. Right. Not because I really enjoy the car or whatever, because it it, it, it fulfills- it, I'm trying to solve an insecurity through money. Mm -hmm. That's when it becomes pathological. So if you can if you can examine that, be honest with yourself with that, what tends to happen, this is what tends to happen- the people that I found that I think have the best relationships with money, they tend to have the stuff that they kind of value, and they don't have the stuff that they don't value. So, like, I used to I, I used to have a uh, I used to train a lot of executives and uh, high achieving um, doctors and surgeons, and I remember I, one guy that I trained. I I love training him because his attitude towards money was one of the healthiest I've ever seen. Now he was a vascular surgeon, and he was a damn good one. He probably would make, I'm sure he made close to three quarters of a million dollars a year as a vascular surgeon. He was a badass and he was working all the time. This guy drove a 1999 Nissan, uh, it was like one of the SUVs, like an old Nissan SUV. It had like 200 something thousand miles on it. <laughs> and he worked out in a shirt that had holes in it and shoes that were kind of old. Now, at first I was like, God, is this guy like a is he a miser? Like, is he just, just work, yeah. save his money, not spending of it? So I remember asking him, like, why do you drive 
why do you drive such an old old ass uh, uh, Nissan? He's like, oh, I fucking love that thing. He goes, I throw my dogs in there. They get it all dirty. It's been with me forever. I don't really care about whether or not I bump into things with it. Um, I just enjoy driving it. And he goes, you know, at home I have a Porsche. I had no idea. I'm like, oh, you have a Porsche? He goes, yeah, I like that too, but I use it for other things. And I'm like, well, why do you work out in, your, in these kind of workout clothes? I'm working out. He's like, I don't care what this looks like. Went over to his house just after a year or something of training him. Gorgeous house up in the hills of Los Gatos. And I knew that he really valued privacy. So he had land. He valued privacy. And I could see the stuff that he put in his home were things that he truly mm-hmm. valued. And I remember thinking like, oh, like he doesn't spend money on what everybody else thinks. He, he doesn't have to walk around with flashy clothes. And that's okay too if that's what you value. But my point is he didn't. Therefore, yeah. he didn't spend the, the, his money on those things. So I think that's where you start to look at the pathology. So like if you're looking at your money like, and you're making money and you're thinking – you know, I'm sad. I want to go shopping at the store to make myself feel better. Well, that's probably a bad relationship with money. You know, you might be better off taking that money and investing it so it can work for you and grow and, and develop some, you know, I've, some I've shared on the podcast a long time ago that I, I built this kind of formula. And I'm not like completely, you know, strict with this ever, but it's what kind of had me, it started me in the right direction of a better relationship with, with money. And that was, at the end of every month, I would look at like all my normal bills, your cost of living, food, things like that. And whatever sum of money that I had left over, I would invest or save half of that. And then the other half, I would allow myself to spend. Mm-hmm. And the harder I worked, the bigger that number became. Yeah. You know, if I got better at my craft, I worked harder. Uh, the number that I was able to save and spend on myself was greater. And if I wanted something bigger or nicer, and I and it would take more than two or three months of saving. Then I would just keep saving that money away, and then I would go and spend it and, and buy. But I would always do that, where it was like I was never taking all of my money, blowing all of it on something, and then like having to wait for the next paycheck to get me by. I was like, so I just created this good habit of you know putting a little away, spending and enjoying a little bit. And now older, way beyond all that, I have just a nice ebb and flow of. I know if there if I've been in a, in a a streak of you know indulging and in spending on myself, then I'll go the other direction and I'll make sure balance that I'm, yeah balance it out by investing more and saving more of the next couple of months after that. So I have this really nice and really what it is is just having a good relationship with money. But I do believe that there is, you know there there is just like there is with food and exercise a big spectrum and there is extremes on both sides and just like in fitness where we look at the people with the amazing bodies and they're all ripped and shredded and we think oh they must have the best relationship with food and exercise right oftentimes it's the worst right and sometimes just because somebody has all kinds of money right and or has all kinds of things that you would think oh man they got it all together when it comes to making money or having money uh sometimes those ones are are not at all and so i think there's a nice balance of the two of them yeah i think i'm still learning you know i think that this is one of those things i've been i definitely was raised more in like a blue collar kind of a setting where i never spent you know outside of my my means and you know when what i worked for equated to what i was able to buy and you know getting beyond that for me and learning how to better optimize you know my investing strategies and be able to uh, make my money make money uh, is something that I'm still I'm still reading and learning and, and trying to you know get better at and implement for my mm-hmm. family. So therefore, you get like all those main things covered, all the rent, all the you know day to day things that need to be accounted for. Everybody's living to where it's you know all all those like foods on the table, the lights are on, mm-hmm. you know the main utilities are. So I just making sure that's all established. Now it's like okay. Uh, since, since I've sort of established that now, how do I be better? How do I optimize? I feel like this is just, this is a whole nother leg of my experience with money. Yeah. Let's talk about debt because, um, debt to me in, if I were to compare it to nutrition, trying to think of a good analogy, it would be something It would be like fasting. Um, you can utilize debt and be smart with it and improve your financial, Stability and circumstances, you can be very smart with debt. In fact, some of the most brilliant millionaires and billionaires in the world tell you to go in all kinds of debt. Know how to work through debt. But most people do not have a relationship with money at a level where they can do that. Debt becomes a big problem. The way I view debt is this. If I, I, I have to want something 
more than I don't like the debt. In other words, I, I almost never am in debt, but mainly because I never really want anything bad enough mm. to go into debt. Now, a house is different. A house, I may want a house, right? I've had one, I've had several in the past, and um, I'm, I, I want that house, and I, I don't mind the debt to have the house. But like a car, for example, I, and this is just me, I'm not a huge car guy. I've realized this to myself, I don't value it so much that going into debt to own a car doesn't bring me a ton of value. But again, that being said, Debt is a tool. It's an advanced, I would consider it an advanced tool for the average person. If you knew, if you had a good relationship with money, a healthy relationship with money, you could utilize and manipulate debt in ways to benefit you. But people have such a poor relationship with money that debt becomes a bad, it becomes terrible. And you see these people who are just, you know, the average American, I think, has something like fifteen thousand dollars of the credit card debt. Yeah. And what do they buy with it? Now you got a massive hole to get out. Of. Yeah. And what are they buying with it? It's not like essential shit. You know well, what I mean? Well, de- debt with a debt with a car and debt with a house are two different things too. Because and and there's of course there's two camps that would argue that with the house and stuff, but a house would still consider, and it is it is a liability, but it's also an asset and it's mm-hmm. also an investment. Sure. Where a car. You know, unless Pretty you're mu- unless you're buying like a rare car, right? Like a classic. I consider yeah. my 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 Camaro is it was an investment. That's actually what made me funny. That we're talking about that. We what made me buy the Camaro. I remember when I had saved up enough money to go out and go buy myself a hundred thousand dollar whip, and that was like a big goal for me. I'd saved up this money to go buy myself, and the younger you know kid in me and the the ego wanted to go get something flashy and new. I wanted to go get some flashy new car that was awesome. And I thought to myself before I did it, and I was, I was shopping all these different vehicles. And, I, and I'd and i always liked, classic Camaro is a, is a car that my, my real father had and drove. And it was something that I always wanted as a kid growing up. And I thought, you know what? I can kind of do both here. I can get something that I've always really wanted, but then also it be something that's an investment. You know, anybody that has classic cars knows that, you know, on average, most of those vehicles go up between six to twelve percent every year, just because every single time one gets in an accident, the value of those things go up because they're even more rare. But things like that, I think, are the other side from classics are things that are regular cars are are a, a different type of debt than like a housing debt. So any sort of debt that I were to consider putting myself in, you know, running credit card to go buy a bunch of uh, electronics or buying a car, I'll never do it unless I have the cash saved. So like when I when you know when I go out and go buy a really nice car, I have that I already have that cash. I'm doing it for the leverage to to build mm-hmm. credit and and that because sure. mm-hmm. we live in a world now where that does matter. And I was you're using debt in a, in in a right in a smart way, right? You know where a lot of people don't understand they don't have the a good they're not advanced enough with the nutrition to go and use fasting for their health. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yep. It's the same thing. Like you, there's a basics that you need to learn and basic rule number 1 is uh you know work hard and make money. That's number 1. Um and don't spend what you don't have and save money. Like if you can't get that down, right. you can forget about investing. Yeah, don't get yeah, involved with the strategies. Yeah, th- you're just going to fuck yourself up. But if you get that down, then you kind of graduate to the next level like okay, I can save money. I don't spend more than I that I make, um, and I, I have a consistent job. I work hard. Now I can look into how do I use debt, leverage mm-hmm. debt, and how do I invest so that I can continue to make this grow. But it's funny. I always tell myself slow to spend. You know, that's sort of like a rule I have because it's just again like those impulse buys and those things. Like it's tempting at first, but for me, it's like Dude. okay, if I keep thinking about it over and over and over, then you know it's, it's something I'm going to consider. It's a lot. Of, it's a lot like food when you think about it. That's why totally. These, that's why it's a great yeah, it's question. A, yeah, it's a it's a lot like food. It's all these. It's all relationships that we can become pathological. You know, there's a I don't know what the number is, and I'm pissed off that I don't remember this, but statistically speaking, people in the in lower incomes. Um, in comparison to higher incomes, spend a much greater percentage of their income on luxury type items. So I'm not saying that they buy more luxury items, but a greater percentage of their income goes to shit that they probably shouldn't buy. Right. So you'll see a lot, you, a greater percentage of people in lower income spend money on things like jewelry or cars or electronics as a percentage of their income than things that are considered luxury, not necessity. Than people who and cigarettes and things like that, things that are not necessary but that are kind of just money killers, a greater percentage, and that's because a lot of times people who don't have a lot of money, a lot of that has to do with the accumulation of the bad relationship that they have to food, uh, excuse me, with uh, with with money. So it's like over time, these people could it be in a higher bracket of savings and wealth, but because they 
they, when they get money, they spend it on this stuff that's not very smart or they have a bad relationship with money. They kind of keep themselves down there. And you can look these statistics up and they're really crazy. Oh, a lot of that's, I mean, it was the, this is something that I battled with as a kid in his early 20s who was making good money. Like I wasn't rich at 20, but I was making six figures, which for me, that was a lot of money. Of that six figures, probably 90% of it was spent on exactly what you said <laughs> because yeah. it was more about everybody else. It was more mm -hmm. about it, the insecurity that I had with being successful, coming from nothing to wanting to show everybody that I am successful now. So therefore, here I am buying all these flashy things, spending all this money on everybody else, picking up bar tabs all the time. And so that's, I was a classic example of that. And most of the time, when you see people like that that have lower income that spend a majority of it, it's because you're trying to look as if you are wealthier than you really are. And what you don't really know is you're really shooting yourself in the foot for long-term real success and wealth. That's right. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download our guides. They're all absolutely free. You can also find all of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam.